most authoritarian states there is always a tipping point for kazakhstan that point came around a week ago with the rise in fuel prices demonstrations led to wider protests against the autocratic regime leading to president tokayev dismissing the government and removing former president nur sultan nazarbayev a symbol of the state as head of the security council the country is in ruins many people living with less than bare minimum wages <laughs> A fuel price hike fueled agitation led to change of guard and wheels of reforms being set in motion in Kazakhstan. Demonstrations against a fuel price rise began just over a week ago before erupting into a wider protest against Tokayev's government and the man he replaced as president, 81-year-old Nur Sultan Nazubov. Burnt out vehicles and buildings paid testament to days of violence. Thousands have been detained and public buildings torched during mass anti-government protests over the past week. Seen as a satellite state of Russia, Kazakhstan looked to Moscow for help. A Russia-led alliance of ex-Soviet states, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, sent troops to restore order. An intervention that comes at a time of high tension in Russia and the United States over the Ukraine crisis. Of course, we understand the events in Kazakhstan are not the first and far from the last attempt to interfere in the internal affairs of our states from the outside. The measures taken by the CSTO have clearly shown we will not allow situation to be rocked at home. As the unrest mounted, President Tokayev attempted to ease the crisis by announcing a 180-day cap on fuel prices, sacking the country's cabinet and firing Nazubayev from his post of head of the National Security Council. He ordered a corpus for reforms to be funded by the very same oligarchs who amassed wealth at the cost of an entire nation's well-being. More than half the wealth of Kazakhstan is outside the scrutiny of the government, controlled by Nazubayev his family and close coterie of people. For nearly three decades following independence, the country was run by Nur Sultan Nazuboev, a former Communist Party Politburo member with strong links to Russian President Vladimir Putin. President Nazuboev resisted any move to introduce more democracy. Public protests in Kazakhstan are illegal without a government permit and previous strikes and demonstrations were dealt with very harshly. The president erected statues of himself and built a new capital, Astana, which was later renamed Nur Sultan in his honor. As a week of deadly unrest, Russia-led forces who were sent to quell riots are preparing to withdraw as President Tokayev nominated a new prime minister. There are fears within the international community that the Russia-China support to Kazakhstan will not bode well for an independent Central Asia. It is clear that it is not in the European interest for the Central Asian state to become unilaterally dependent on Russia or China. On this too, we will and must have a close exchange between our two countries. But change of guard in no way means change in the way things are run in the country. Nazarbayev's daughter, Dariga, became Senate Speaker a day after his resignation, suggesting she might become the long-term successor. Global Omicron surge continues and this time it is China that is trying to contain the virus ahead of Beijing Winter Olympics that is scheduled to be held in the first week of February. After Henan province, Tianjin became the second and Xi'an the third province where strict restrictions were imposed after certain clusters of Omicron variant cases were found in the community. Here's a report. With Winter Olympics round the corner, China started to see a surge in COVID-19 cases in various cities. Recent spike in cases resulted in shutting up of public transportation services from port city of Tianjin to other cities. The city is just an hour from Beijing, hence it has been put on high alert. The port city reported 41 Omicron variant cases this week. 
making Tianjin the first city in China battling a cluster of Omicron cases. Several cities are asking for mandatory quarantine for those arriving from Tianjin. These patients are still mainly with respiratory systems such as cough and some patients also have shortness of breath. This time the number of patients with headaches is relatively more. But compared with the past, the proportion of patients with diarrhea and loss of smell and taste is relatively less. Overall, the number of patients with fever is relatively less than in the past. We have implemented point-to-point -point pickup method for those arrivals monitored to be suspected of getting infected or coming from medium and high-risk areas to avoid the risk of transmission. China is seeking a surge right before the Lunar New Year, which is a peak travel period. But with the Omicron threat, the authorities have put out strict travel advisories. We have implemented point-to-point -point pickup method for those who arrived and monitored to be suspected of getting infected. Lockdown, strict border and quarantine policies and digital contact tracing has helped China in containing the virus so far. But with the spike in cases, how effective Chinese vaccines are against Omicron remains a question. Welcome back to World Today. Now, Novak Djokovic's Australian visa row has dominated headlines across the globe since the tennis star was detained in Melbourne last week. While the court has decided to allow him to play in the men's draw, Australian Immigration Minister Alex Hawke cancelled his visa. Here's the full report. Australia has cancelled Novak Djokovic's visa, a decision the government says was taken in public interest. This is the second time that the world number one's visa has been cancelled in less than 10 days. The decision means that Djokovic, who remains unvaccinated, can be deported. A court had earlier revoked the Serbian's visa cancellation, but Australia's immigration minister exercised his discretionary powers under Australia's Migration Act to overrule the decision. The nine-time Australian Open winner was hoping to defend his title next week which, if he won, would make him the most successful male tennis player in history with a record 21 Grand Slam titles. After the court order, Djokovic made a statement that left him open for more criticism, many even calling him a liar. He had revealed that despite receiving a positive Covid result, he broke the isolation protocol and attended his tennis centre in Belgrade for an interview. He also admitted there was a mistake in a section of the form that covered his recent travel history, for which he shifted the blame on his agent. Djokovic's visa was first revoked shortly after his arrival in Melbourne on 6th of January after Australian Border Force said he had failed to provide appropriate evidence to receive a vaccine exemption. There has been a huge backlash from some Australians who have lived under long and strict Covid lockdowns that Djokovic had been allowed in despite being unvaccinated. The 34-year-old Serbian can still launch another legal challenge to remain in the country, but the Australian Open, where he's been top-seeded, begins on Monday. Besides, there's already been too much damage to the reputation and embarrassment to one of the greatest athletes of all time. Now, what next? Sports Bureau, India Today. Mohammad Sadiq was an infant when India was partitioned in 1947. He was separated from his family. His brother Habib grew up on the Indian side of the partition line. Now, 74 years later, at Kartarpur Corridor, the corridor that connects Gurudwara Darbar Sahib in Pakistan to India, these two brothers were reunited. It was the year 1947. India was witnessing the horrors of partition. It was then when Muhammad Habib, a resident of Punjab, had last met his brother, Muhammad Siddiq, in Pakistan. Subsequently, separated from him by partition of the subcontinent. Time stood still 
when the two emotionally embraced again at Kartarpur Sahib. After 74 long years, moved to tears and in tight embrace, trying to erase decades of separation. Speechless, but overcome with intense feelings. Two elderly turbaned men, hugging, crying, celebrating, melted many a heart. Siddiq now, 80 year old, is from Faisalabad in Pakistan. Habib, in his late 70s, managed to trace his long lost brother using help from Good Samaritans and social media. Yes. A get together was planned at the Sikh shrine of Gurdwara Darbar Sahib in Kartarpur, nearly 5 kilometers inside Pakistan territory. And it was a reunion like never before. The brothers are now planning to catch up, rewind and relive a life they never had. With Arshdeep Kaur, Bureau Report, India Today. Time for World at a Glance, where we take you through some other stories that made headlines from across the world. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologised for attending a Bring Your Own Booze party gathering at his official residence during the first coronavirus lockdown. Boris said he regretted his actions and believed the event was work-related. Opposition leader Sir Keir Starmer said the Prime Minister must now quit over his pathetic excuses and ridiculous lies. U.S. President Joe Biden's administration imposed sanctions on six North Koreans in its first response to Pyongyang's ballistic missile tests. The sanctions also targeted one Russian and a Russian firm for procuring goods for North Korea's ballistic missile programs. Italian Catholic and Jewish leaders condemned an outrageous incident in which right-wing extremists put a flag with a swastika on a coffin outside a church after a religious funeral and gave a Nazi salute. Police said they were investigating the incident as a possible hate crime. Denmark's spy chief Lars Feinstein has been imprisoned for allegedly leaking classified information. His name was made public after a court in Copenhagen lifted an order that prevented his identity from being revealed. In a major political development in Afghanistan, National Resistance Front leader Ahmad Massoud and warlord Ismail Khan met with Amir Khan Mutaki, acting foreign minister of the Taliban government in Tehran, Iran. According to the Taliban sources, Mutaki proposed that they can return to Afghanistan and assured that they will not be harmed. Ahmad Massoud's camp says they have rejected the offer. Buckingham Palace announced Prince Andrew's military titles and royal patronages have been returned to the Queen. This comes after the court refused to dismiss a sex abuse case against him. That's all in this edition of World Today. Thanks for watching. See you same time next week. News and updates do continue on the other side of a short break here on India Today.